suggests a mind starting to come apart is a self-portrait taken and hand reworked by Rebecca Barnett around 1992. About 12 years before the signs began to appear that showed that her mind really was coming apart. Sometime in the fall of 2012, about two and a half years before she died, Beck looked at me and in a rare moment of obvious recognition, her eyes caught mine and she said, sad, sad sad that she would say anything at that point is remarkable for most of her speech was intelligible only to someone with great linguistic ability or literary genius which wasn't me um, even more remarkable is that she was still able to know what had happened to her and to us and to assess its emotional weight. But I mean to push beyond the sadness of her story and let her story probe the limits of what it is to be hu human. All right, so we begin more than half a century ago. Here's the girl then known as Becky Barnard when she was still a toddler. Here she is at five or six. Um, here she is in high school when she won a presidential full tuition scholarship to Washington University in St. Louis. Here's Becky at 23. By, uh, by this time she had graduated from Washington University with a BA in music and was working for the music department and studying for a master's in English. I met her four years earlier in 1972 when she was 19. Here she is at about the age of 40. By then she was going by Beck. She ended up, like me, in information technology as a way to earn a living. But it was not her driving passion. She became a serious fine art, photogra fine art photographer. And this photo, which she took of herself, shows her determination and sense of who she, who she was. Here are some of her other pictures when she was shooting. She did not want anyone nearby. Don't talk, don't be seen, she'd say to me. She also said that when, when I'm with my camera, it's as though the world were giving me all these gifts. Beck loved collecting things. When I realized that her visits to thrift shops never seemed to stop, I asked her, Beck, what primordial urge are these visits satisfying? Without a moment's hesitation, she replied, hunting and gathering. Another time she said, well, I'm training my eye. And her eye was her own. Beck was uninfluenced by fashion or convention. She celebrated the efforts of others to make beauty in their lives. And even if the effort was clumsy, she managed to make it more beautiful in her photography. She loved the beauty in ordinary things. In museums, she never wore headphones because she wanted to look at paintings and other objects without filters. And she always insisted that the street was the best museum. This is a picture, by the way, that she took um, uh, two and a half years into her dementia. And uh, you may know that it's the Mummers Parade, January 1st, 1908, yeah, here in Philadelphia. Uh, but back in 1997, uh, many years uh, before she was diagnosed, uh, back nine years before, uh, right after my divorce, Beck and I start seeing each other. Four years later, in 2001, we marry. The next year, 2002, we're both out of work, and Beck moves in with me. 
Yes, that's right. She moved in with me a year after we were married. Um, uh, she lost her job in the first mass layoff in the history of A.G. Edwards, which was then a family-owned company. They had a policy of no layoffs, but they were they had a new CEO, non-family CEO, and A.G. Edwards has since been sold twice and is now part of Wells Fargo. She worked there 11 years, and I suspect part of the reason for her being part of that mass layoff was her incipient dementia. In uh, 2003, Beck is still shooting pictures, but not working. She has no dark room anymore, and I print this picture of an oak leaf hydrangea. I print it for her digitally, even though she thought that digital photography was the antichrist. Um, I'm not sure what she would say today. Uh, and it, it wins a contest at the Missouri Botanical Garden. Sure. The urge to take pictures continues some time into her illness. Late in February 2008, Beck and I stay with her Uncle Angus in Sacramento, California. Beck always has her camera with her. And she knows that she has a show coming up in May. Uh, uh, the Maryville University in St. Louis gave her a retrospective of her life's work. But her sense of space was puzzling. This is uh, early in 2008. If you draw two points on a piece of paper and ask her to guess where the midpoint is, she has no idea. Her concept of geographic relations, San Francisco to Berkeley, Berkeley to Oakland, is almost non-existent. Although, to show you how complex the brain is and how complex our, 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 our visual processing is, here is someone with a severe visual spatial de deficit, and yet she was able to point across San Francisco Bay and ask correctly, is that Alcatraz? Now, even more remarkable is that she continued to compose picture, pictures with deliberation and know what a good picture is. So even though her sense of direction was totally shot, she couldn't draw uh, uh, or imitate a picture, um, she still had a sense of what a photographic, good photographic gestalt was like. Here she takes a picture of me and her uncle Angus that shows that her eye was still remarkable. Notice that she cuts off a portion of my head in the way a casual photographer might not have, or, or maybe a clumsy amateur might have, but not deliberately. But in fact, I know this was deliberate because it's typical of many of her photographs because the focus was on the scene as a whole. It's back in 2004, okay, before her diagnosis. Beck still has no work. She doesn't seem to have it together to apply for a job. I think she's depressed. She says it's hormonal, the effects of, menop of menopause. We go to therapy together. In the spring of 2015, not 2005, sorry, spring of 2005, Beck sees my father on the stairs in my mother's house on Long Island. It's during a reception following his memorial service. He's been dead for three months. By summer's end, she repeatedly forgets to close car doors. In the fall, she's sitting next to the coffee pot. Our friend Dwight and I are drinking coffee. I ask her to refill my cup. She asks several times, which is your cup, and then pours it in the wrong one. She parks her car in the garage at an odd angle so that I have to repark her car in order to get my own in. In New York. She gets on the wrong commuter train. I pick her up at another station and drive back to the station where we had left the car for her. And she doesn't return to the house when I do. I call her cell phone. Where are you? I ask. I don't know, she says. She's crying. 
is there a street sign back? Uh, uh, she says, yeah, yes. Well, what does it say? What does the sign say? Dead end. Three months later, Dr. A, a gastroenterologist, has sent back to the Washington University Memory Diagnostic Center, where she sees Dr. B, a neurologist, on her 53rd birthday, the 6th of April, 2006. The diagnosis is severe cognitive loss of undetermined origin. He orders her not to drive. She says, well, that's okay as long as it's not progressive. In the summer, a second memory diagnostic center neurologist, Dr. C, nails the lid of the coffin. He writes dementia on the whiteboard in large letters. Beck says, my life is over. An awkward pause follows. The doctor is no longer sure of himself. He says, well, you, your life is not over. The silence is unbearable. Dr. C cannot tell whether she has uh, Lewy body dementia, <coughs> frontotemporal, Alzheimer's, or something else. I convince her to go to a session at the Alzheimer's Association called Getting Connected. The nurse running it. And now, these are very good programs. Uh, and the Alzheimer's Association is wonderful, but not all programs work for all people. And, and well, the nurse running this program made a point of emphasizing that Alzheimer's is a fatal disease for which there is no cure. The panelists discussed problems in advanced stages like incontinence in the car afterwards, Beck starts to scream. Her screams are the loudest I've ever heard. I mean, she would, she would drown in Niagara Falls. No, no, her screams would suspend the falls in, in mid-air as if time had stopped. I, I have Alzheimer's. I have Alzheimer's. Oh, God, why didn't you tell me? Oh, God, oh, God, what will I do? What will I do? Why didn't you tell me? Time unsuspended itself. Half an hour later, in the food court of a mall called the Galleria in St. Louis, Beck says, rather calmly, I guess that was my first primal scream. Don't know why I was screaming. I already knew I had Alzheimer's. For more than two years, Beck lives at home, but becomes more and more dependent. Starting in the winter of 2007, Beck participates in the clinical trial. The nurse in red, uh, Pam Millsap, became friends with Beck. I mention this here because they were both full of life, fun, and unending goodwill and although Beck was the one with the horrendous prognosis, they both died last year, a month apart. Pam first from cancer, several years younger than Beck, and Beck from her unrelenting loss of brain tissue. Well now, let's go back to 2007 when she was in the clinical trial. By the end of the year, Beck needs help dressing, bathing, and even using the toilet. We go to Baltimore, and here she is at the Baltimore Art Museum, not looking so happy. We go to Baltimore for a philosophy conference. We attend a session on cognitive loss and ethics. Just happened to be there, and we went in. A young Professor pre presents the case, uh, uh, presents cases like that of a woman faithful to her husband all her life who starts an affair with a man in a nursing home. 
should she be stopped? Unhappily, the speaker asks the question this way. Should you honor the wishes of a person in the early stages of dementia after she ceases to be a person? Beck whispers to me, she doesn't know what she's talking about, and then says, I have to go to the bathroom, which was her way of saying, get me out of here. Well, during the discussion, which I attended, I, I placed back in another session on uh, the, the, the uh, Iraq war. Uh, during the discussion, audience members re refrained from raising the specter of the Nazis of the Ku Klux Klan, but the outrage at uh, that phrasing was palpable. One man says that people with profound cognitive loss deserve to be called persons in honor of the capacities they once had, even if they can no longer do anything. And I learned later to my dismay that this uh, use of the word person has become rather frequent in American philosophical discourse, although in the, in the 10 years since, it's, it's somewhat dissipated, and that um, young philosopher who has uh, matured since no longer talks that way. Um, but a year later, okay, so we were in December of 2008, a year later Beck has been in hospital psychiatric units, the doctors have, had, have tried numerous powerful antipsychotic medications and electroconvulsive therapy, normally called, or commonly called shock therapy. I'm struggling to keep her at home. About a year before, she asked me, is there something wrong with me? And not wanting to answer directly, I said, nothing that will make me go away from you. Now Beck resists taking her medications. She thinks of them as a sign that something is terribly wrong with her. In desperation, I hold her head and try to force the medicine into her mouth. She backs away from me and crashes her head into a wall phone, which falls to the floor. She holds her injured head and says, Oh, sweetie. Oh, sweetie. I'm just a person. I'm just a person. And then she walks into the living room and says, oh, sweetie, oh, oh, sweezy, oh, squeezy, I'm in a mad place. Beck's assertion of her own humanity was a rebuke, not just to the philosopher, but to me as well. I was stunned at what her disease had led me to do. And it's also a rebuke to anyone who turns away and wouldn't see her as she is. Especially professionals who should know better but let her condition prevent them from seeing her. When Dr. B, the neurologist, the first neurologist Beck saw, ordered a four-hour battery of psychometric tests, Beck sat in the psychologist's office afterwards visibly distressed visibly distressed by how much she could no longer do. She couldn't, for example, draw a clock and put the numbers in it in the right place. The psychologist, whom we'll call Dr. D, talked to me as if Beck were not there. Remember the second neurologist, Dr. C, who did not quite know what to say when Beck said her life was over, except to contradict her? tell her she was wrong. Oh yeah, he was, he was trying to comfort her. He was trying to say, no, your life's not over. But I had to learn this, that what you don't say to someone with dementia is, you're wrong. And why wasn't his first in instinct to say, I'm sorry, this must be hard to hear. And I recognize that letting someone know that he or she has a dreadful, incurable disease, may be the hardest thing a physician has to do. But nevertheless, he let his 
professional demeanor stop him from, from first offering sympathy. Now, I know that Beck has received good care, often superb care, from dedicated doctors, nurses, therapists, aides, volunteers, many of whom perform their jobs not just with skill, patience, and determination, but also with obvious love. Uh, Peggy Swabble, for example, a therapist specializing in aging and uh, uh, dementia, and she was one of the speakers at the symposium Jason and I uh, participated in. Uh, she was able to calm Beck down in a moment of the highest anxiety, and it's difficult to imagine that she just would not stop moving and uh, would not stop talking. But Peggy knew how to touch her, how to walk with her, and somehow get through to her. Um, I'm going to pause here to mention that another person who helped Beck, Vicki Bells, she appears on the left in this uh, slide. Uh, she was the manager of the um, residential care home that Beck lived in for two years. Vicki, who passionately dedicated herself to providing end-of-life care to mostly elderly people, died of lung cancer a year and a half before Beck. And uh, like Pam Millsap mentioned earlier, she was several years younger. No aide or nurse who was committed to work with dementia patients would ever question whether those he or she assists every day with eating, walking, washing, taking medicine, toileting, or overcoming fear are people. Yet sometimes the disease seems to overwhelm the supposedly more sophisticated professionals because there's nothing they can do. And so they, they fall back on old habits of thought. In uh, mid-August 2008, Beck's precipitous decline began with an especially difficult weekend. At times, she was inconsolable and became convinced she needed, uh, uh, and I became convinced she needed medical attention. At night, I tried to go to bed and Beck Beck stayed up. She wandered from room to room, bellowing and crying. I have to leave. I have to get out of here. I want to go home. Somebody help me. She ended up downstairs, sprawled across the bed of her mother, who was visiting. She said to her mother, I tried to make it work. I tried. I tried. But I can't do it anymore. Richard, Richard needs someone else. By the time we reached the psychiatrist's office a few days later, Beck was stopping people in the lobby saying, help me, help me, my husband's crazy. The psychiatrist, Dr. E, said Beck was obviously psychotic and needed to be admitted right away. The word psychotic seemed as if it were a word from a foreign language. Well, yes, I, I thought Beck is misperceiving things, but that's because her brain is deteriorating. And more than, more than that, her misperceptions are driven by a fear that something terrible is happening to her. And it is. There's a monster inside her head, and it's real. And by the way, that, that a young psychiatrist initially placed her in an adult psychiatric ward, uh, where Beck, walking in, says, oh, this isn't bad. There are three Van Goghs here. Um, but it was the wrong place, because she obviously, even though she was 55, she belonged in a geriatric psychiatric ward where they knew how to take care of, or supposedly knew how to take care of people like that. Anyway, that was in August of 2008, two days before Christmas. I did what I swore I'd never do and placed Beck in a nine-resident assisted living facility, Schutz Manor. It was a wonderful place, a small, um, 
beautiful home. Two days later, on Christmas Day, I drive back to her brother's house. On the highway, the trees, buildings, and sky move past the window. The neurons are flying, she said. The neurons are flying. I want to tell you about a remark made by Beck's primary care doctor, Dr. A, about nine months after she started living in Schutz Manor. Uh, but this remark uh, needs some background. By April, she had started to lose the ability to walk. And by September, when she saw the doctor, she spent her days in a geriatric broda chair, which is kind of like a recliner on wheels if you're not familiar with it. But even more important is that her language was changing because Dr. A commented on something she said. Now, language was not Beck's initial loss. The neuropsychologist, Dr. D, the one who talked to me, not to Beck, the one who determined that her visual spatial deficit was severe, said her language was above average. Although for Beck, that was probably a degradation. Here are some of the things that Beck said uh, when she was in the hospital for the first time. I still want to be at Washington University around what people are doing there. Can you figure it out? I need my education back. Now, these remarks, though indirect, are, are not hard to, as Beck asked, figure out. She was losing what she knew and what she could do. The education she had received was slipping away. She said things like, it's that I can't do it the same way I used to be able to. You get the sense, even though the syntax is a bit odd. But here's a remark that might puzzle a doctor who did not have the contact and lead him or her to think that she was talking nonsense. I have to look and see what has happened with the cat and not be unpleasant. Can you make that your very most? That was it, she stopped. Now, there's much captured in this fragmented utterance. She was away from her beloved cat, Princess, whom she had rescued from a frigid winter years before, and who had been a source of comfort as her illness had grown worse. She wants to know if the cat is okay, and she doesn't want the cat to be frightened. And the whole hospital confinement has been unpleasant, and Beck senses that she herself may have been unpleasant. She urgently wants me to help. Make that your very most, she says. It doesn't matter who the president is or what the season is, the questions the doctor asks. What matters is that she's losing who she is and can't stop it. I'm so stupid, I could die. I've got to get out of here. Her image of herself was as a smart person. I'm going to die. I'm dying. Doctor, doctor, please help me. That was in September 2008. So in January, about five months later, January 2009, soon after she moved into Schutz Manor, I began to record her speech. This was while well, she was still walking. And here's a sample.
the time we go to Dr. A, the following September, Beck is no longer walking, and her speech is even more broken up. Dr. A listens to her talk with utter amazement. It's astounding, he says, what can happen when the brain stops working as it should. Okay, I say, but, but let me show you something. I turn to Beck and ask, Beck, do you like me? Like you? Like you? Richard, I love you. Hmm, says the doctor. Uh, but she has no idea what she's saying. This, this is a good doctor. A caring doctor. A smart doctor. But this remark brought home how much theory, how much one's assumptions about a disease can blind you to the person sitting in front of you. Beck wasn't quiet. And yet he didn't notice that she had changed the word like to love. Of course, she knew. She was attuned to the semantic content of what she was saying and the emotion it conveyed. I started recording back at the behest of a uh, psychiatrist, Abolish Desai, who was then at, uh, at, at St. Louis University. Uh, and he said that, he says, the speech of dementia patients really hasn't been studied that much, but he was sure that it's not a word salad, as it's often characterized. And over the years of listening to Beck's speech, a number of persistent themes became apparent in the phrases that broke through her pattern into intelligibility. And chief among these are love, life, and loss. About a month, after the doctor said she had no idea what she was talking about in the fall of 2008, Beck turns to me and says, Richie, Richie, yeah, she never called me that before, but that's how it was coming out. Richie, I was life. Now, in January, a few months later, I catch her on video, and it's a primitive video of using a cheap digital camera, uh, I catch her on video saying, well, I I'm going to let her say it. And this is uh, a very difficult video to watch. And I would, I would not show it if I hadn't told you something about her life before. And this is where I'm going to have to switch um, modes. So let's hope this works. <laughs> question I have never asked before. Do you want to die, Beck? I say it slowly and then repeat it. Do you want to die? I can easily imagine her saying yes. She stares for about a minute, not looking at me. I'm not sure she understood the question. Then she turns toward me, screws up her face and says, I love life, diddle, diddle, daddy, love life, love life, diddle, love, love, love. You often hear of people who want to write living wills that say they want to die before their dementia gets too bad. Yet here is Beck, who once thought she should jump <clears throat> off a highway overpass, who has been through suffering no one should ever have to live through and who a month before said that she herself had already died, still says, I love life. 
three months later, back as sitting with a nurse who was who was trimming her nails. Hold on, I have to find this video. Um, she's sitting with her nurse, she's trimming her nails, and Beck says, I am life, <coughs> shortly after the beginning of the video. And uh, just at the end, she recognizes me. She'll look up and she'll recognize me taking the video. October 2012, uh, Bex was a physical therapist, um, Chris Pettit, and here's another video, let me just cue it up. How's that? The therapist is using a stand-up frame yeah. to get Bex to sit up straight, the stand-up straight, and it's a stand-up frame broke some vocal energy on Bex. Go all the way straight. <laughs> But her speech is more stifled, less coherent than in the previous video. It's hard for her to form words, but, but the impulse to say something is already there. Now she's going to see me. Can you see who's here today? Hey, Beck. Same idea as at the end of the prior video, but with fewer, more strained, and even more desperate words. About six months before this, my grandson, who's now uh, five, he was approaching two years. And at that time, he was about at the same language level as Beck. But there was a big difference. Beck was not a toddler discovering the magic of language, struggling to find words she hasn't quite yet mastered, but someone who remembers what it was like to express herself. Not that she can recall any specific instance of doing it, but she feels it deep inside and finds it painfully hard even to formulate the ideas that her inner urges promote. As Beck continued her long, slow decline, a guardian angel arrived. There. Shortly after Beck started living at the uh, Riverview, the home where she spent the last four and a half years of her life, a woman in her 90s named Willie Ethel Brantley began dining at the table next to Beck's. She and I started talking, and I introduced her to Beck. Hello, Beck, she said leaning from her, her standard wheelchair into Beck's large broided, broided chair. Well, Beck doesn't say much, I explain. But if you talk to her, she'll know you're there. And she'll hold on to you. She's quite strong. And I put their hands together, and they were holding. And I said, so maybe from time to time, you can talk and, and hold her hand. So Miss Brantley said, Oh, I knew God put me here for a reason. For more than three years, she talked to Beck two or three times a day, every day. And she still knows how to be soothing and insistent at the same time. 
And here's an example of Miss Brantley persuading Beck to sit up. Right. Nice See, you know you Nobody knew that film. You could do that yourself. You know why? Because you're very, very smart. Yes, you are. You're real smart. And you're very intelligent. And you can sit up when you want to. I would be so pleased that you shoot that That was good, Beck. It was good. That was nice. That was just beautiful. I told you you could do it. Miss Brantley had a stroke about 60 years ago in her 30s, from which it took uh, three years to recover. I know what it is like, she would tell me, to want to say something and not be able to. She was convinced that Beck would get better and would um, walk and talk and take pictures again. Beck's mother and I tried to tell Willie Brantley that Beck was not going to get better, and her reply was, you're not talking to the doctor I'm talking to. <laughs> well, I, I didn't share Miss Brantley's uh, religious optimism or her vocabulary, but she doesn't appear to hold that against me. She's broad-minded enough that you can do Jesus' work even if you don't use his name. Even if you don't use his name. Uh, and for my part, I am very much in favor of what resulted in a devotion that enabled her to see back more clearly than most people and to foster whatever capacity and humanity Beck had left. Miss Brantley was Beck's in-house advocate. If she found an AIDS treatment of Beck to be inadequate, Miss Brantley told her so and added, just because she can't talk, don't think she doesn't have a voice. Because as long as I'm here, she, she's got one. I, I know that Miss Brantley over-interpreted some of the things Beck said. But I've come to realize that quite often, most often, over-interpretation is better than under-interpretation. Interpretation. And many times I know that Miss Brantley understood Beck exactly. Now I have another story about Beck and Ethel Brantley, but I think I should tell this in the context of Beck's continuing sense of playfulness. And here we are back in 2008 at that Mummers Parade where she took that picture of the street devil. And you can see her having a great deal of fun. Now in the summer of 2010, two and a half years later, uh, but here, is this video I'm about to show you is uh, Beck's stepmother and stepfather getting ready to leave for a visit, from, from a visit. And um, you sure? her, her father gets up and tries to encourage her and watch Beck's eyes after the We'll father. see you. Okay. And her father since has died four years ago from Alzheimer's which became apparent after that. Don't be a good girl. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you think someone who can't speak and seems not to understand has no sense of humor, think again. Now, I, I want to go back to um, before Beck stopped living at home, uh, uh, back to the first year uh, after her diagnosis, when I thought I was living in a Marx Brothers movie. Uh, so many uncanny associations emerged from her mouth with, with such spontaneous fluidity as to leave me dumb, dumbstruck. Now, Beck stands outside the bathroom with her, her underwear and leggings down below her knees. She complains she's having trouble getting them off. Try sitting down, I say. There's no place to sit. Well, I, I point. I said, what, what about the toilet? It's a toilet. I 
drunk, I go to another room, I bring a chair, I put it down, and say, sit. She holds up her arms with mock paw as mock paws and says, woof, woof. <laughs> I apologize. Perhaps it would please my lady to sit here. That's your lady ship, and it will come in soon. About a year before Beck died, when she said maybe one or two words a month, a student studying to be at CNA overheard her talking in bed. Perhaps she was asleep. And Beck said clearly, I don't know what happened. And I'm not sure I, I do either. And that's, that's her story. Thanks. You know, uh, in, in hearing uh, uh, Richard's story of Beck, um, I, I, I hear it through several different, or see it through several different lenses. I hear it through several different ears, perhaps. Um, and, and one of them is, the, is the, the, the perspective of a physician. And from that perspective, uh, as an internist, um, I can say, you know, all disease is lousy. Um, that's the nature of disease. I think someone that would say the disease is pleasant or, or something other than unpleasant would be perhaps a madman. Um, and to be a patient means to suffer. That's the nature of being a patient. And so as I listen to Richard's talk, I think about what's the nature of suffering in persons with dementia. And I've spent a lot of time reflecting on that. And, and, and one of my uh, main answers to that question has been and remains uh, the loss of our autonomy, uh, particularly the loss of our ability to exercise our autonomy, to make decisions, make plans, execute life's goals, claim oneself as a person, um, change one's gender, to choose who to marry, vote, choose not to vote. That we lose that. We lose that early in the disease. Many aspects of autonomy early in the disease. But then, of course, I reflect listening to uh, Beck's story, you know, but who really has autonomy and, and who do we grant it to? So I wanted to think more about what's the nature of the suffering that makes one a patient with this disease. And I think what I hear in the remarks that, in the story, excuse me, the, the narrative that Richard shares, is to see the subjectivity of the disease. That even after, and we could debate what is autonomy, and at what point Beck lost her autonomy, but at some point, her autonomy was sorely lost, and yet the person remained. And there was a subjective still experience going on, a subjectivity there. I wanted to just offer some reflections on that subjectivity. I'm in a mad place. The neurons are flying. And I'm an awareness of the location and the source of the symptoms that she's experiencing. I would need my education back. I'm so stupid, and even more profoundly, I'm going to die. I died, I died. It was that religious vision, if you will, of sort of facing death, seeing death. Something that I have a feeling we would never deny was experienced by the two nurses, the research nurse and then the clinical nurse who died of cancers, a disease that we have stereotyped in the 20th century as you know, the suffering experience where you face death and face it down and then finally surrender. And here we have someone who's long lost perhaps what we would consider autonomous functioning is still facing death. And yet also there was the subjectivity of her enjoying life, of, of humor, of, 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 of the eye roll at her father. See you later, girl. I'm not a girl, I'm a woman. The eyes are rolled. <laughs> it's her dad, you can say that. I wanted to offer a reflection that um, I've been reading much about lately. Um, 
which is how, even in the absence of the loss of language in the lives of persons with um, dementia, the connection that they can have with music uh, that almost uh, brightens or enlivens and whatnot. It almost becomes sacramental. And indeed, if you reflect, with the exception of a few aesthetic religions that seem to want to sort of deny all aspects of what's fun, how much music runs through most ceremonies and aspects of life. Again, all disease is lousy. That's the nature of disease. If it wasn't lousy, if it didn't cause suffering, it wouldn't be a disease. And so thinking here at the Perlman School of Medicine and the Perlman Center for Advanced Medicine, you know, we think of the scientific challenges that this disease faces us. And our scientific challenge is how to treat that suffering. But there are other challenges that I think we have to look to other disciplines for. And one of them is a religious or spiritual challenge about how to kindle hope. I'll give religion and spirituality hope. I'll give the scientists the path to figure out treatments. And then I think what we're left with, or not left with, but is there's a third challenge, which is a moral one, which is absent a cure, complete cure, erasing the disease from the natural history of disease, we have a moral challenge, which is how to live with that suffering. And so Richard, I want to thank you for sharing your narrative, because I think it illuminates those religious and spiritual and moral challenges so brilliantly.